On behalf of Fielding Graduate University and the Office of President Katrina Rogers, here we are, Women Who Rock, conversation with the Ace of Cups, a band for all generations. My name is Connie Corley, and I'm the host of this event. You can see I have a variety of roles at Fielding, which is an age-friendly university, one of over 70 globally. Part of our mission as an age-friendly university is offering learning opportunities to all ages. So let me share a bit about the Ace of Cups and our time together today. After a brief introduction to each band member and sharing a bit about their history, we'll hear their recording of Put a Woman in Charge from their second studio album, Sing Your Dreams. We'll then have conversations in pairs with questioners across a range of generations, helping us learn how the band cultivated their craft while navigating decades of change to become an incredibly inspiring band relevant to today's world. Feel free to add your questions, which we'll review to ask the band before we close. And at that time, uh, when we wrap up, we'll share more about the band's website and their albums. I'm going to introduce you to the band one by one. Mary Simpson Mercy hails from Northern California, Weaverville. She's a vocalist and plays guitar and is learning the ukulele. Denise Kaufman, now in Kauai, is a vocalist and plays bass guitar and harmonica. Mary Gannon Alfiler is also in Kauai today, a vocalist and guitarist. Diane Vitalich hails from Novato, California, is also a vocalist and a drummer. Dallas Kraft, also in Novato, joined the band in 2019 and is a vocalist and plays keyboard. We were very honored at Fielding to give the Ace of Cups a, an award called the Creative Longevity and Wisdom Scholar Practitioner Award for 2020. We have the ceremony and conversation with the Ace of Cups band on Fielding's YouTube channel. So where and when did the Ace of Cups come about? They were considered the first all-female rock band and their origins date back to 1967, the Summer of Love in San Francisco. The band was named Ace of Cups by their first manager, astrologer Ambrose Hollingworth, after the Ace of Cups tarot card, showing a cup with five streams of water. The streams symbolized the five of them, and he said they should go with the flow and see where the music would take them. It took them to stages with Jimi Hendrix, The Grateful Dead, and more recently, to studios with fellow luminaries that include Buffy St. Marie and Taj Mahal. The Ace of Cups released two studio albums in 2018 and 2020 and have been featured on many radio and television shows sharing their dynamic music and passion. In this picture, as you can imagine, this was back in the early days, four of the original band members plus one of the founders, Marla Hunt. The band's Bay Area roots became the home base for their studio recordings decades later. These vibrant and talented women all take turns singing lead vocals and all sing harmony and backing vocals as well. So let's hear Put a Woman in Charge from the album Sing Your Dreams. Enough is enough. I know the answer. 
for being with us. We are very delighted to have not only the five band members who I've shown their pictures, now you'll get to hear them live with a conversant. And we chose members of our community or affiliates of our community, ranging in age and cultural backgrounds and occupations. And our first pair is Tika England who will be talking with Diane Vitalich. So we've got about five or so minutes per pair. And then again, any questions you might have, feel free to put them in the chat. So uh, Tika and Diane, if you are, uh, I wanna make sure that you're both uh, here to be seen. Yes, there you go. Tika. And heard. <laughs> yep, I think I, I got the mute. Great. <laughs> okay. I'm going to introduce Tika. We've already introduced Diane briefly, but you'll hear more about her now. Tika England is a costume technician currently working as the cutter and draper in the theater and dance department at the University of Kentucky. As someone who started out as a history major, she sees a strong connection between the survival of craft skills and the concept of passing down techniques between generations. So Tika, take it away. Awesome. Um, so as, as a historian, and has been noted, um, I'm always interested in social movements and the music that they interact with. Um, so how do you, Diane, think the interactions of music and social movements have changed throughout your career? Well, I really don't think they've changed that much because <laughs> it, it keeps going on and we have to just keep on going with the process and and, uh, you know, all the songs of love and freedom um, have been around forever, and uh, especially in folk songs. Uh, and uh, in the Ace of Cups, one of those songs would be uh, Sister Ruth, which is a good example. And uh, other songs that have influenced me through the years is uh, Bob Marley, Get Up, Stand Up, Stand Up for Your Rights, and Bob Dylan, uh, Political World, uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary, uh, I Had a Hammer, and of course, the Beatles, uh, you know, give peace a chance. That's political to me and beautiful. <laughs> Great. Um, is there any technology that we have now that you wish you had earlier in your career? <laughs> that has got to be the cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's our everything nowadays. And uh, mainly because for me, anyway, the video camera in the cell phone. Because years ago, uh, I mean, the Ace of Cups were lucky enough to get footage in the movie Revolution. Um, it was at the Festival of Growing Things in uh, 1967, 68. And, um, but, uh, you know, to have a movie camera, you it was a giant thing that you had to carry around. And uh, it had to be, you know, seen through a projector onto a wall or a screen. And so if we had cell phones back then, uh, we could have, you know, documented all those you know, hundreds of gigs that we did. So otherwise, uh, we did get that one uh, revolution movie out there. So that was great. Awesome. Um, is there anything you learned along the way that you wish you had learned earlier? <laughs> I would say uh, that's relationships. Because <laughs> um, I was said that back for years, thinking that relationships come first, and that no matter what the circumstances are. Um, I was raised to get married and stay married, but eventually I had to move on after repeatedly having to learn over and over the lessons and that the lessons were I was missing emotional support and it was I was stopping myself from doing what I love, which is music. 
which actually honestly ties amazingly into the next question. What <laughs> keeps you going? <laughs> okay. Faith. Faith keeps me going. Uh, no matter what the outcome, there's always something to learn and uh, to help you grow. And um, for me, I've been working on um, my negative thoughts. <laughs> so by giving myself a pep talk and telling the negative voice to shut up, I can start to really uh, try to, you know, look through that and see there was a book out that was called um, uh, by uh, Katie, uh, not Katie, but uh, Byron Katie. And the book was, um, don't always trust what you think. <laughs> and I learned a lot from that, but I would like to add to that. Don't always trust what you're told and don't always trust what you hear. Um, I think my last question, sort of personal <laughs> to me, uh, if you could give one piece of advice, of life advice to sort of the 20 and 30 year olds of today, what would you want us to learn or to know? <laughs> I would say, think wise, be kind, compassionate, and make a friend that doesn't look like you. Great. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, Thanks thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you both. This was really delightful. And now we're going to have Angela, Dr. Angela Sadler Williamson, join us and Denise Kaufman. So if you could make yourselves available to uh, talk and take it away. Hi, Denise, how are you? So good to see you. It's great to see you too. Let okay, so you I want to- Dr. Williamson first. Dr. Williamson is a faculty fellow at Fielding and an independent filmmaker, speaker, and author with over 25 years of experience in communications, marketing, and public relations. Dr. Williamson's the host of KLCS's PBS show, Everybody with Angela Williamson, which emphasizes diversity within education, the arts, and people. And you can see that uh, uh, Dr. Williamson and Denise are already good friends from this experience. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Connie and Denise. I want to tap into a little bit of the 1960s counterculture in San Francisco and have you tell us a little bit about how that counterculture helped Ace of Cups in the beginning. Well, I think what was particularly beautiful about those early days in the 60s in the San Francisco in the Bay Area was there was really a sense of community and sort of brothers and sisters um, that we all felt. And um, as the Ace of Cups started to uh, share our music and get out there, there was a kind of upswelling of support for us, which when I read about later all women's bands in different places uh, or watch like the Go-Go's documentary, they did not have that. Um, and I think it was a unique, unique thing to the Bay Area because we were all in those early days trying our best to take care of each other. The diggers were free feeding people in Golden Gate Park and there was a free clinic and there was free medical, I mean free medical, there were free legal uh, clinics and you know there was just so many ways that we tried to care for the uh, nascent and then burgeoning community. So I think that really helped us uh, because people kind of looked at us as sisters and daughters and you know we we got we got some good love from people i love that and so we talked a little bit about this and and everybody knows this women won big at the grammys this year i mean unlike ever before so in your opinion do you think that women um, are making progress in the music industry. And then I want to find out from you, do you think that there's still some stereotypes there? Yes and yes. I think definitely progress is being made in the music industry, not only in front of the camera or the, as performers, but as producers, as directors, as uh, technical, you know, all the technical ends. I think women are, the women who, who um, mastered our last album is Emily Lazar. So she's a leading person in the mastering part of recording. Um, so yes, 
yes, there are more women in all aspects of the music industry, but I think there's still quite a ways to go. I think um, that the, you know, there used to be this thing, and I don't know how much it still exists, even when radio was the main way you heard music, uh, that in an hour of music programming, there would be like maybe one woman. And they would, if you asked the DJ, they'd say, well, we already played our woman this hour. <laughs> so for equity to happen, um, that's gonna be a while, but I think we're making progress. Wow. Well, thank you so much. And that actually leads to my next question. And Diane and Tika touched upon it a little bit, but I wanna hear this from Denise. So what does social justice mean to you? It means that we all need to educate ourselves because we were not taught the real history of what we've inherited. Um, and we need to take steps to create equity now. And that often to me means we need to go back and figure out how do we level this playing field? How do we bring forward the people that have been push down? How do we put them first? How do we shine a light on the stories that we weren't told? And, that, and, that, and to um, really look at the, how do we remediate on every level? And I, I love what Diane said about making a friend who doesn't look like you. I think that's really important. Um, we need to broaden our circles of, of, of acquaintance and friendship of, of people that we're, we talk to. And we need to have the the difficult conversations and be, be willing to ask the questions and be willing to re-examine everything that we were given or raised with or told and, um, and get much more expansive in, in the way we hold life. I, and I completely agree with you about Diane's statement. It resonates. I think it resonates with you, with me, and with everybody in the audience. So my next question really follows up with this too. What do you think is the biggest societal obstacle facing Ace of Cups in 2021? Well, I think uh, as in the 60s, we were sort of... Um, pioneers as being women doing what we were doing. Now we're pioneers as being women in our 70s doing what we're doing. And I think ageism is huge, both for men and for women. Um, but the sort of intersectionality of both being women and in our 70s, um, a lot of people, you know, you know, for people to look at us playing, it kind of changes their reality. Um, and it's somehow it doesn't with a lot of the men that are our age that are playing, that's sort of been accepted. But women are, you know, and sort of culturally women are often only considered a value during their like reproductive age or something like that, you know? So for women to be elders in the society and rocking and have juice and being, being writing and singing and playing about what matters, um, and uh, I think that's really important. And I think that a lot of people just kind of can hardly go there. You know, I think that, um, that, you know, that we're kind of, we're breaking ground, not like we're the only ones, but there are very few of us that are breaking ground in terms of ageism and women. So. And that leads to my next question, talking about ageism and women. Um, I wanted to get your advice for Gen X women, um, such as myself, who are headed in their 50th year, or as I would like to say, I've already headed there. What advice would you give to us um, about following our passion? I, I think um, it's interesting. Um, my daughter is 50 and um, last night, I went with her rollerblade. She went roller skating and, and she's gotten really into roller skating, which she used to do when she was nine or 10. And then um, it's sort of come back. It's a bit of a thing now. And, um, and just watching her skate around this basketball court in the town of Kapa'a last night was so beautiful. And I was like, what is it that you have loved when you were a little girl that you kind of had to put on the back burner because of life and career and children and whatever else, you know? Um, 
you know, now maybe there are new passions that you have and you want to totally give yourself permission to honor those, but maybe there's some things from when you were small that you, you know, someone told you, well, that, that doesn't look like a house. You can't draw or that doesn't sound right. You shouldn't be singing. You can't be in the choir or, you know, or as happened to Diane, you're, you know, you're, you want to play drums. Well, girls can't play drums. You have to play the tambourine. So whenever you, if you got shut down and I would imagine we all did, yeah. you know, that you, re, you know, resurrect those places in you and start to honor them and give them some, some love and, uh, and don't let anybody shut you down. Oh, Denise, thank you so much. Our last question before we end our conversation today, in your opinion, what female band best represents Ace of Cups today? You know, I actually don't know. I don't think I'm up on all the female bands um, and it may not be bands. It may be, it may be individual voices. I mean, there are a few voices I really love, you know, Brittany Howard, Anais Mitchell, um, um, the band Ranky Tick. I mean, there's so much music I love, but I would say whoever is pushing the limits, those are the people who represent Ace of Cups now, those voices, those women who are stepping out in ways that um, haven't been done before. They're pushing at the envelope and I would like to honor them all and thank them for keeping everything rolling forward for all women. And thank you for setting and being the trailblazers with Ace of Cups for to open the door to a ton of women in the music industry. Thank, thank you. Thank you both, Angela, Denise, what a great conversation, and it keeps on rolling. So our next pair of conversants is Anthony Lopez and Dallas Kraft. And we already got a little taste of Dallas. You're gonna hear more from Dallas right now, but Anthony Lopez is a uh, member of our fielding community working in the Institutional Research Department. He's a recent graduate of UC Santa Barbara and is a Santa Barbara local. How's it going, Dallas? Hey, Anthony, good to see you again. Good to see you too. Um, kind of touching on the previous conversation um, about the woman winning big at the Grammys, uh, how have you seen the role of female artists kind of evolve in the music industry over the decades? Um, well, I think uh, it, there's always been some sort of a role of um, the artist to uh, shine a light on the human condition, whatever it is, but um, really not as much as recent um, recent decades. Um, before, you know, women were in front of big bands, usually men, and uh, the most famous of them would be more, it would be all white band. Um, they'd have all black bands. They would, you know, monopolize the radio. Um, so a lot of minorities weren't being heard as much. Um, then as, you know, folk movement goes, it comes in, then there's a more integration um, and um, female artists like Joan Baez and Odetta and um, Joni Mitchell and, um, you know, again, shining that light on, uh, on uh, the human condition, as it were. Um, you had way back, you had um, uh, Maybell Carter, who was a pioneer in uh, founding modern country music, um, showing the world through her eyes and uh, the area that she lived. And um, you had Billie Holiday through Strange Fruit, you know, her beautiful um, uh, figurative language describing something as ghastly and ugly as a lynching um, that she was, you know, not even allowed to, to perform in most audiences because it was an embarrassment to, to uh, white audiences. Um, so I, I think um, these early women were showing you know, shining a light on it, telling the story of the, whatever it was, the oppression, it, also telling a story about good times too. Um, Sister Rosetta Tharp, fantastic musician. A lot of these women were really great musicians and went at a time when women weren't playing instruments. Um, and Sister Rosetta Tharp 
uh, fantastic guitar player. She's like the godmother of rock and roll mm -hmm. with her um, guitar playing and her, her singing and writing, songwriting. But um, when you were talking about the, the Grammys, I mean, her, you know, H-E-R, um, which amazingly um, sounds, it's having everything revealed, having everything revealed. And, and that's what she's, she, she does, you know, with um, the, the song that she had, I Can't Breathe, you know, for George Floyd, shining a light on that, Black Lives Matter. Um, um, there was uh, the country artist that we heard um, at the Grammys, uh, Mickey Guyton, Black Like Me, and her audience is a very conservative country audience. And so very brave of her to stick her neck out there and um, have a, a protest song or showing her life experience. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, these artists um, now are really blazing a trail. They're opening doors for new artists to come up and, but they're also holding the door open. So it's making it easier for, um, for artists to really tell their story through their experience, through their eyes. And, and letting letting it out, letting the truth be known. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's a great take. Um, yeah, going um, kind of into the social media aspect of uh, music. So with like Instagram and Twitter and all these new social media outlets, uh, music's been like very accessible um, and expanding exposure to different artists. Do you see this as a positive or um, some people may say it's a negative because it could oversaturate the market, but um, what's your take on that? I, I don't see it as oversaturating and um, gosh, if I had, if, if <laughs> social media had been around when I, I made a CD in uh, 2000, even 2000, as late as 2000, um, um, I wouldn't have had any way to, um, I, I didn't have any way you know, to get my music out there, really. Um, it's perfect in this time of COVID because artists can um, either live stream, um, uh, they can, um, it's great for activism, bringing, drawing an audience in, directing them to a cause or, um, you know, another website or a call to action. Um, it's great for um, just posting your music um, so that people can hear you. Um, darn it. <laughs> They've been around. It's a great community. So. Yeah. But we, we enjoy, um, you know, making use of it. And I, I don't think, you know, you, it's not an oversaturation, I don't think at all. Okay. It, it does do a lot of positives for the music. Yeah, community. I think so. Yeah. And um, coming into our final question, um, you mentioned her, um, H-E-R, and uh, are there any other popular artists today that you like to listen to? Well, um, I'm very eclectic in my tastes, but, um, uh, you know, Denise mentioned Brittany Howard, and I, I, you know, I just, I just love everything about her, because she is who she is, 100% authentic. Um, she's passionate and um, totally, you know, pushing the limits. Uh, great musician, um, great songwriter, you know, and, um, it, it, you know, Alabama Shakes is just a fantastic band. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, she made me think, she made, you know, jogged my memory about, about her. Um, uh, yeah, I really, I really like her a lot. Nice. You know, I really... Yeah. I really enjoy her. Yeah, she is great. Great just for just getting a message out there and letting her truth kind of just spread. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I'd like to thank you for the conversation and the insights. Um, I definitely learned a lot from our conversations and just oh. like to thank you for your time. And uh, thank you. Back to you. <laughs> oh, thank Hi. you. Really exciting. I just enjoying this and Hope that all of you out here who are listening are thinking about your questions too. Feel free to put them in the Q&A area because we will have time. We've got two more pairs of conversants. Our next pair is Dr. Harry Rick Moody. We all know him at Fielding as 
Rick Moody, who's a faculty fellow in the Creative Longevity and Wisdom program, which I direct at Fielding Graduate University, and the author of seminal books in aging. He has a special interest in later life learning. Of Mary, because Mary and I have already been connected, and we opened up this a little bit, the question of how is it different for the artist today compared to when you were in your 20s? And this comes out of my longstanding interest in how creativity changes over the lifespan. Right, right. What's, what's your take on that? How has it worked out for you? Well, I thought about your question a lot, and we kind of fooled around with it. And uh, as a performer in my 20s, I mean, you're young, there's sex appeal, uh, you have energy to really give it everything you got. And I always felt a little bit like an interloper because I was a singer, but I was the last person to learn the instrument on the bass. But, um, and, and even then, after the honeymoon of the band, and I can remember our second year or so together, there was little times when we would, you know, say, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, and then as performers, we were always able to rise to the challenge, but sometimes in the uh, rehearsal, when you're jamming and uh, writing songs and we would write backups together, um, then if you're a little bit angry or something, it just stops that process unless you can get over it. And it's a, it's a little hard to get over it sometimes when you're younger. In my 70s, uh, I do, some of the same challenges appear. Um, I'll just give you one example. We were jamming uh, last year in March, actually, <laughs> just before the close down. And we were doing a song that I had a couple of lead lines on. And uh, Dallas, who's a really good singer, uh, bandmate, said, um, why don't you try, I could do a double lead on that with you. And I went, hmm, okay, that means I lose my solo, right? But right. Um, so we tried it there in the rehearsal. And you know, I had that, nur, nur, you know, and then I went home and listened to the recording of it. I said, oh, this is so much better. You know, so I think in my 70s, I'm able to think things through and really look at what's good for the music, that kind of thing. Whereas in the 20s, sometimes it goes by so fast, you don't always get that chance. I, lo I love what you're saying for several reasons. One, because uh, George Marshall, the great Secretary of State, once said, there's no limit to what you can accomplish in Washington as long as you don't care who gets the credit. And so he said it so perfectly because you've described a process which maybe a sports team, maybe musical groups, I've been a choral singer myself too, when you subordinate yourself to the process, to the music, something much bigger comes out. And that's what you're saying. But here's a question I have about the band. You, you were on this peak of, of uh, about to break out in 1970 or thereabouts, and then something happened. What happened in those 50 years? Uh, I, I'm not asking for all the details, but there was this huge gap. And what caused that is what are elements in the world, what structural features in our world or the world that we've lived through? I'm the same age you are, I'm 76, maybe a couple of years younger. What, what was in that world and, and how did you cope with it? Well, the whole culture had been ripped open. There's no doubt about it. When I was trying to think about your, your questions, like what happened and everyone's interest in, in the Haight-Ashbury and what yep. happened, well, the whole thing came, up, came open. And it's not just the hippies and the turn on, tune in, drop out, which was very much what happened. Right. But it was also like uh, it, it, the groundwork had been done by the beats, by the artists, just the poetry that was the boroughs, all of them that were in the yep. 50s were coming up. And, and then you have all these questions and we, it was obvious to us, you know, uh, love each other, get out of right. Vietnam. Uh, yeah, you can share, I'm gonna share with you. Uh, that was short lived, that real high of knowing. Yep. Like I, I thought of the Dylan song, the answer is blowing in the wind. The I answer mean, is blowing in the yeah, wind. I mean, what is that? The answer is to love each other, to share, sure. and um, to be friends with people that don't look like you, for sure, or think like you. Mm -hmm. and most of us that I remember were from middle-class backgrounds. Yeah. And we did converge, and they were most, a lot of Californian, but people were coming from New York. I mean, it was definitely a thing. And then in the 70s, to answer your question, I think that, um, the the nightmare it's like a bad dream where you really see that <laughs> yeah, you're reminding me <laughs> you're right you're right or how they said money talk
it walks like that kind yeah. of thing happened like then there was the very wealthy rock stars there was um yeah and then i think specifically for us to um you know two of three of us had children and um that's a whole nother thing i mean now you're a mother and so uh it was yeah, wonderful and fun and now like there's another human being with you and then there's you know things it, written in my dna that you know, mothers should do this, you know, even though I didn't do a greatest job, I knew that to, for my daughter to survive, I had to uh, take it a little bit easy. And at the same time, people were just breaking up. There, there were, I don't mean bands necessarily, but no. they were too. People were dying. I mean, that was a wake up call, Jimmy and Janice in the early seventies um, and many, many more and people that we knew so then we knew what was this about, you know, addiction and- uh, So we encountered the limits. You encountered limits uh, of different kinds, maybe a big limit like de death and dying. Yeah. How about today? Uh, you're not young anymore. And by you, I don't just mean you, Mary, but okay. all of- I own it now. You own you know, it now. The funny thing is my parents never told me who, how old they were, ever. And all of my friends too, parents, I never knew how old they were. They never- It was considered embarrassing. You don't yeah. ask people that. No, because I always think people weren't, didn't make it enough at what right. they thought they should have by 70. So that yeah. they're like, you know, it was like all these jokes about age. It's like, I think in our band, it's so far out. I love it. I'm 78. I'm right. 76. I'm two years older than you, by the I way. Know. I know, I know you are. I know you're my elder. So that's why I'm asking you all the questions. <laughs> you yeah. said something else that interested me very much because in, along with artistic creativity, one of my other areas of interest is comparative religion. I wrote a whole book yeah. on that. And I'm interested in a comment you made about how different members of the band came from different faith traditions. And maybe it took some time to learn what that really meant. And maybe the traditions themselves changed. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. It interested me very much. No, I, I, I mean, that was the first thing I remember about something very different than my um, bringing up in New York, Catholic school girl, Pleasantville, New York. Um, I know was, where it is. <laughs> was American Indian, like, uh, when the hippies moved out of the city into a Marin and North, um, there was Indians that showed up. People had connection with some of the tribes in above Sonoma. There was the embracing of the Indian thing. And that was the first thing where I was learning from Running Bear, like, take off your shoes and feel this under your feet. Like, a, oh, okay. And then really being moved by it. And then um, Denise, my good friend, um, and, and I was always attracted to people of the Jewish faith. And I, I don't know why I think it was from my dad had a good friend, um, uh, Dr. Finkelstein, but I think that, um, we, uh, learned together, like she brought, uh, the Tibetan book of the dead, um, different Hindu, uh, practices. We, we did yoga with Yogi Bhajan. Uh, it, it was like, what is in this world? That was that was really a big thing and a big opener. And um, I remember I gave Denise a small gold uh, cross from Alaska and she wore it. And uh, we went and saw gold to her mom and but her mom, <laughs> what are you wearing? <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like me putting on the Star of David, which I do. I mean, I love right. it, you know. So we were, I, I understand. Um, we were sharing and caring about <laughs> right. each other and saying, well, are we one, you know, and, and what does it mean and, and practicing those things. So yeah, you were becoming, great. you were, you were be paradoxically becoming closer, but also retaining your differences. She didn't become Catholic. You didn't really become <laughs> Jewish. And no, yet there was a connection there. I see Connie Corley has appeared on the screen. Do we have questions from our listeners or any other questions like that? Well, those will come up, but we have our last pair, which includes myself Good. and Mary Simpson Mercy. And we had a great conversation a few weeks ago. Um, I just wanted to say I've been so fortunate to be able to actually hear the Ace of Cups uh, a couple of years ago at a wonderful fundraiser in the backyard of Lily Doolin, who I think is here today. And also we had a positive aging conference uh, that fielding hosted in Los Angeles, and that, that was a few years even before that. And uh, 
that was before Dallas was part of the band, but the, the band also played there. So uh, I'm just so excited now to have this opportunity to talk to you, Mary, and um, ask you to talk a little bit about some of the early influences uh, for you musically and um, how you, you know, you've been a musician really for, for most of your life and uh, studied with y Yorma Kaukonen from the F Jefferson Airplane. So talk a little bit about like, who were the people who influenced you the most? Yeah, uh, as a child in my family growing up, we, I heard, uh, we had an album, you know, a 78 of Mahalia Jackson. And I used to love to play that. I mean, I just loved listening to her. And we also had uh, music by big band. So I heard big band music a lot around the house. I also heard a woman by the name of Hatta Brooks, who was, uh, she played boogie woogie music. And uh, she was featured in some movies. Uh, is, am I making a sound or not? Because my... Uh, well, somebody's got a, a timer or something, but that's not mine. So, oh, it stopped. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Okay, now you're on mute, so you have to unmute yourself if you. Uh... So also, then later I was listening to you know things like Fats Domino, Little Richard, uh, The Supremes, you know all that kind of stuff, all the stuff that was in the '50s that everybody listened to. I remember uh, we had a neighbor, a girl, um, Ann Brown was her name. And her father would like break her records, you know, just like he didn't like the fact that she was listening to rock and roll and stuff. But fortunately, my parents were very <laughs> nice about, you know, I could play whatever I wanted. So it was, it was great. And they were supportive. I mean, anything I wanted to do, they would support, like I was in dancing, ballet and tap dancing for seven, eight years. And when I wanted, I went to a Girl Scout camp and the, one of the counselors there played the guitar and sang. And she had this streak of gray hair and it was like mm -hmm. totally natural, it was nothing. And I just was so entranced by her and I go, I wanna be able to do that. I've gotta be able to do that. So then I went home and asked my parents, you know, could I learn to play the guitar? And they said, sure. And, you know, got me kind of an older guitar. I mean, not older, but not a good one. And they said, if you play it for a month, we'll go get you a really nice guitar. So I did, I mean, my fingers were hurting like hell because the strings were, you know, off the neck. You know, it was one of those <laughs> where it really hurt. And uh, so then after a month, they bought me this beautiful classical Goya with the ribbon, ribbon, wood in the back, the maple, curly maple, and it was just beautiful. Um, so that was it, you know, and then I think I was in a talent show where I played in front of the whole student body and got a standing ovation and I thought, oh, great, you know, this is something I would love to do. And then fortunately met the other Ace of Cups later in, you know, in the, in the Bay Area. So uh, I had a, a vehicle for, for doing that. Yeah. You know, I'm intrigued by your story about seeing the woman playing the guitar with the streak of gray hair. And, uh, you know, so much of what we've talked about is the influences of musicians and people who came before us. Do you think that music is a way to connect across generations? There's so much talk about generational divide and so on. Right. But yeah. how do you think music makes it? I, I think music not only goes across generations, I think it's a universal language that goes across the whole world. You know, it's it's definitely, I mean, the, the fluidity of it, the fact that it affects people. You could be listening to somebody, a song in French and, you know, but you, you move with the music, and even if you don't know French, the music you, it just somehow comes into you. I, I think into your right brain, you know, your intuitive part. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, it's a universal language, so it cuts across every kind of barrier, I yeah. think, really. Right. Yeah, totally. Well, that's what we love about creative longevity and wisdom. I want to thank you, Mary. And now we have some questions that okay. came um, in, and uh, I want to uh, tell you about uh, Pablo Morales and Brian Lopes. They are uh, uh, part of the President uh, Katrina Rogers' office uh, team. And so they have curated these questions and um, I think they're gonna go into the chat. Is that how this is working? Yes. 
And thank you, Connie, and thank you, everyone. The first question comes from an anonymous attendee, and he, he or she asks, what does your band name mean and where did it come from? So I think if the band members want to unmute and uh, put their videos up, you know, it may be a little chaotic, but whoever wants to take that question, go for it. How about you, Denise? I'll take it. Um, the Ace of Cups is a tarot card. And as in regular playing cards, the Ace is the, like, the highest um, expression of what that suit is. And the suit of cups in playing cards relates to water, love, creativity, flow. And in the, the that tarot cards that uh, our first manager showed us, he, we were around his bed in the hospital. He had had an accident and he pulled out this card of the Ace of Cups. And it was a, a card with a divine hand coming out of the clouds with this chalice and five streams of water flowing into water below and the little droplets of water flowing up. So it, it, it was this circle of love and creativity and music. And, and um, we just looked at it and said, oh, there we are. Yeah, Dallas, show us that. Show it again. <laughs> a beautiful picture. there it is and when we looked at it we just went yeah that's our name so okay okay Pablo, or is it brian uh, it's brian brian pablo transitioned to brian hello uh we have another question here to you who will to whoever would like to answer um question is uh is it ever too late to become musical such as learning an instrument and such. I can answer. Yeah, don't worry. Absolutely not. And you know, just what I think Denise brought up about being told in elementary school, no, you can't do that. Or, you know, you stand in the back and move your mouth, but don't sing. It's like those things, it's like, they don't, it can happen once and ruin it for a person. I think absolutely there's groups together, especially with the ukulele. The ukulele, as Mary attests to, is four strings. I, I teach ukulele, I did for many years, with one finger and strumming, you can make a song and the beat goes on, C7, and the beat goes on. And so you just, and, and that's just a simple thing. And I think if you really wanna go for more to take lessons from somebody that you respect in the instrument or the vocal that you, that you wanna learn. And yes, I don't think it's ever too late. And I think 80 year olds should be singing because you know, like it opens you up. Anybody else? We could all talk about that for the whole rest of the time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> all right, we have a few more questions and then we're going to show the band's website and Facebook site and uh, talk about their studio albums. But, um, Diane, I think you should also address that question. Is it ever too late? Oh, it's never too late. Actually, I've gone back to taking lessons. <laughs> I've had one so far. And um, it just, it just uh, rekindles your spirit again, you know, to keep on learning because there's, it's never too late to learn what, uh, you know, even if you've, you're a musician that's been playing for years, you go back to learning something. And it, it, brightens what you do and it just uh it's never ending and there's never too much to learn okay i think we have time for two short questions before we start to wrap up and we can stay on beyond the official time because we're having so much fun uh brian pablo Okay. Anonymous attendee says, I would love to hear about creativity the band members have engaged in offstage between the summer of love and 2018-ish when they compose their album. Not just the kind of creativity that gets credit from others for being creative, but what the band members themselves think was creative in their lives. Mary Ellen, you want to? Yeah, yeah I, I will. Um... Yeah, I, I just think that there, the combination in the Ace of Cups is that when we're together, things start to happen in the, in the realm of creativity. It's just something about 
the uh, dynamics and the sin the sinistry between us you know so we will we'll come up with songs like someone will bring a song in partially done like I tend to do that where I've got a verse and maybe a chorus but I, I need another verse and then Denise is like she loves to you know help and you know flush stuff out and she'll ask a bunch of questions about what you want to present but Anyway, all of us do that, you know, when we'll give suggestions about this part or that part. And, you know, we don't take offense uh, about it because it's like we, Mary and they were talking earlier about, you know, it's the bigger picture. You want it to be good. So you take in these different ideas and it's just a fantastic um, way of, of being together. I mean, a marriage is like, I mean, a, the band is like a marriage in a way, you know, you, you learn how to get through different things and um, you just learn how to give and forgive and all that kind of stuff that is important in life. Yeah, I, I will. I'd like to say something about the creativity of the intervening years because um, Mary, Mary Ellen is a beautiful painter. She's, she, she a picture in my kitchen here uh, that she, she did. So she got really into painting. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think all of us have other expressions. And I think for those of us who raise children, there's a lot of creativity in, in, in that process, right? You know, you know um, just trying to especially be to parent in a way that wasn't passing on some of the, um, the notions that we were given that we didn't feel like we wanted to pass on to the next generation. So we were really, you know, working on, you know, how do we empower the next generation? And I think, you know, in everything from gardening and cooking, and I, I started school here in Kauai, but then there was like yoga and all the kind of different things that we've done. And it, in, to me, it's really creativity is the spirit that you can bring to anything you're doing, right? And, and, and you can be doing what looks like a really creative thing, not creatively. <laughs> so it's sort of like really inviting that openness into our, ourselves and then approaching, I don't care if it's cleaning the house, you know? Um, and I, and I, I would say that if you're cleaning the house, you should put on the best rock and music can, so why <laughs> I would totally agree with that. That's the only way I can get any housework done. So <laughs> uh, let's take a, a pause for a moment so that we can share uh, a bit about the band's website so you know how to go to that and uh, where you can hear their music. And then we can stay on because we have over time you all have here. So uh, this is the Ace of Cups website, which is rich with like so many interviews that they've done. And this is their Facebook site is on the next uh, slide here. Just uh, what it looks like when you're looking at it on your, on your phone. And they have two studio albums. They did record prior to 2018, but their Ace of Cups self-titled album, a double uh, album with incredible music and guest artists. And then more recently, Sing Your Dream, which is their second studio album. You can see there are many ways to be able to enjoy uh, the Ace of Cups. And uh, we hope that you will, if you haven't already, listen to some of their music that, that you will be doing so uh, while you're doing your house cleaning and all the other fun things to do in life. So before we go to um, any other questions, I did want to give uh, my deep gratitude to the members to Rachel Ann, who is the the unmanager uh, behind the scenes doing a lot to help uh, the band uh, keep going, especially in the, you know, challenging times that all of us have been through. And this is why I think music is most important. Brian Lopes and Pablo Morales, I've already thanked, but I can't thank them enough from uh, Katrina Rogers, our president's office. And of course, Carol Hiroshima, who's behind the scenes here, but really helped us uh, get on to the Facebook. She's a multimedia specialist at Fielding. So I'm going to go back to uh, Brian and Pablo who were curating the questions. We do have time for more. So 
Go for it. Uh, well, this is Brian here. Uh, to all the ladies here, uh, this is from uh, Patrick, and he asked, ladies, what do you consider to be your legacy? That's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to say you have a legacy. <laughs> go ahead, Denise. I, I think I, that I have a legacy. Yeah, you see? <laughs> Oh, a legacy. Okay. Very funny, Diane. <laughs> I would say that because we, because we had never heard an all women band when we started, you know, we were the first ones we ever heard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and so I think our part of our legacy is that we, you know, as, as, pioneers and and we weren't the only of all women's bands in the world in those days there were some others a few but you didn't know each other because they were in different parts of the world and you know if they were just playing in Liverpool England or something we you know we didn't know about each other till later till you know the internet and things so I, th I think that that it's that our legacy is the encouragement to do something unheard of and to put yourself into something that maybe you've never seen. You know, and I think politically these days, every time you see a little girl say, well, I, you know, look at Kamala Harris or I look at, at um, Stacey Abrams or some, you know, I look at someone who looks like me and it makes me think I could go into this field. You know, I think, and we've had for all of our lives, Ace of Cups, young people come up to us, particularly young women, or by the time we met them, older women and say, you know, my mom took me to see you in Golden Gate Park when I was nine years old. And I said, mom, I have to play the drums, you know, and because that little girl saw Diane, you know, or, or play the guitar. So I think, you know, our legacy is being amongst those early people that did that just the way the, ast the women astronauts or the women physicists or whoever you are when you're breaking into something that was a, a closed old boys club that you know we're part of the legacy of opening that all up and you know it's not just for women because it's for men and boys to see that women can do this you know and like you know that's really important anybody i think sometimes that's a tough question legacy because it's not one I believe in our Western culture that we really honor. And yet it's important. We didn't have the legacy of the people who came before us and then creating our own legacy. And sometimes people think of it just in terms of their family, but clearly in the work that you have all done, it's been your families, your communities, and the people that you don't even know that you're influencing. And now here today, you've had even more people to influence, and we will have uh, this available on the Fielding YouTube channel, and the Ace of Cups can also uh, put this recording on their YouTube channel as well. So I wanted to see if there were uh, any remaining questions, Pablo, and... Um, yes. Spring Grove Groove says, Ace of Cups, you gals are so awesome. You have also collaborated with so many great artists already, but have you considered collaborating with any younger known artists to illuminate intergenerational collaborations? If so, who would you love to work with and why? Yeah, we definitely have. In fact, we did do, uh, Denise has a grandson that's a musician and at one of our gigs, uh, was it Oregon? Oregon State Fair. Uh, oh, is that the Kate Wolf? Kate, Kate Wolf in Northern California. He sat in with us and we were just so pleased. Yeah, Mary Ellen like shared her lead with him and she sat behind him and we just all great. loved it. So, I mean, that moment, but I, I, I it's, it's kind of hard to do that right now, but we, we do have one in the wind, right, Denise? With uh, Yeah, I mean, Rachel Ann has been our, our unmanager, has been talking to the manager of the tank. Um, and so there's a possibility we might do something with her. Um, we, um, we did a, you know, I, there are people I would love to, um, to collaborate with. And um, I mean, obviously, um, 
I, I think there's a woman named Anais Mitchell who I really love. And she wrote a song called, Why Do We Build the Wall? And I think she's brilliant and I, I'd love to do something with her. Um, and, you know, and we'd be interested in hearing from young artists that would be interested in doing things with us um, because mm. I think an intergenerational collaboration is just a super cool, you know? And um, we didn't let people do that on our first record on our, you know, people, my friend Lily Hayden is an incredible Oscar, I mean, a Grammy winning violinist. She offered to play vi uh, violin on our first album. And I said, no, you're too young. We only want our old, our old friends on the first album. We were just like, but now I think, you know, maybe our third album is in work in works. We've got half of it done, but we have some songs that we're still writing and you know, it would be great to bring in some younger artists for that third album. Don't you think? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Illuminate them. You know? you to work, collaborate with? Diane? Oh, was there somebody that I wanted to collaborate yeah. with? Um, well, there's some, some really great drummers out there, lady drummers that, you know, just, I thought, oh my gosh, they're just, I mean, uh, she Lee, which actually she's on her album. Yeah. <laughs> and um, there's uh, Patty Ann and uh, Smith. Uh, that's just incredible. There's a couple ladies, uh, you know, I just thought it would be great. That's for drumming. And uh, as far as singing too, there's, there's some awesome lady singers I would love to sing with. <laughs> um, uh, well, anyway, so anyway, we're all inspired by other people as well as ourselves. And uh, to get that inspiration and bring it in, uh, you know, there's possibilities there. Great. I wanted to see, I, I can't remember, I lost track of how many questions there were that uh, remained, but I wanted to also see if any of our conversants who had wonderful one-on-one -on -one experiences had any questions for other band members so um angela said she's fine uh but you know rick anthony Luca, this is your chance to ask uh in the in the present moment and of course these relationships now can be cultivated going forward we have, uh, I, I wanted to answer i thought rick was going to ask me dr rick i'm going to call him doctor he said just call me rick i don't care you went to school you earned doctor I really admire doctors. So, you know, he said, what about, uh, what's my, me what would be my advice to the young? And I, and I thought, you know, and I thought about it when we're young, it's so much easier to love and to let things go by, you know, um, as we age, sometimes it's more like, you know, what you did, you hurt me. You took, you take your grown up toys and go home and lock the door. <laughs> and, and, um, I just think forgiveness is fierce. It's a fierce battle. And that's what we're involved in now. And um, I would I would tell the young, you know, if if you don't if your mom and dad uh, aren't there to guide you because of the many broken families, please find an elder, somebody like us, an elder or a grandma, a boys and girls club, someone that will show you that kindness works in the world. Mm -hmm. and don't, don't be so shattered. So you know, I love the young. We love the young. Dalai Lama put it best when he said. Be kind whenever possible. It is always possible. <laughs> that is good. That's wonderful. You know, we're in, uh, in overtime. I have a question. Uh, what is going on next for the Ace of Cups? Are you, are you all working on a, a third album? Is there some events going on? And can, you, can you give us a little sneak peek of what's going on for you all? Okay. Um, yes, the third album is about I think maybe half done. We would have been doing it this last year, or at least in early 2021, except of COVID, for COVID. Um, and we would have been touring because we, we had to cancel the gigs that we had, you know, uh, this last year. Um, so all the places that we are hoping to play or we're going to play, none of them have um, I mean, we don't, none of those are, well, except for one place that with the fur piece ran for, we really want to go in um, 
which is Yorma Kalkinen and Vanessa, his wife's amazing venue in Ohio. Um, they, they postponed our show there for a year. We don't know whether we'll be able to make it this year or not, or at least it, in June when they would hope to schedule it. But, you know, I think all venues are going to be finding their way now into how to operate. Um, the thing for us that's a little difficult is that we are in, you know, Mary, Mary Alfieler and I are in Hawaii. Um, Diane and, and Dallas are in Marin County and Mary Ellen is up in Weaverville. So, and we're not, other than I will say Dallas, the rest of us aren't so technically great to be able to, um, to do, you know, if, if some of the bands that are separated, they, 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 the members have their own home studios and they've been recording themselves for a long time. So putting things together is a little bit easier if you've got your own home studio. And, you know, we don't except for Dallas and Diane to some degree. Um, so we're working on some things that we're putting together, but it's a little bit slower <laughs> because we, we just need some help on it. But we are working on some things to release from a distance and we're looking forward to when we can all be in the same place. Um, at this point, some of us are vaccinated and I'm feeling much more positive about traveling in a couple of months, you know? And, um, and so I, I think that, I think it's not in such a distant future that I could pull out a bass and stand next to Diane and but she's playing the drums and be in our yes. room. You know, and I, I <laughs> not a whole whole bunch. <laughs> I miss you. I miss playing with you. <laughs> I see Rachel Ann has her hand up. Rachel Ann, you want to come on? And hi everyone, how are you? Hi Rachel. My camera is not working. Um, speaking of the Dalai Lama, Denise, I was reminded of the event coming up with Buffy. I thought since she fits into so many of the inspiring things that we're talking about, what a lovely little quick. So I just thought I'd pop in and um, let everyone know that um, Buffy St. Marie, another incredible pioneering woman, very influential to Denise and the ladies. She's a longtime friend. She's a guest on our album and she has her own incredible legacy. Speaking of the word legacy, here's a perfect example. But on April 12th, uh, in the UK in April 11th in North America, she's doing a virtual meeting with the Dalai Lama as part of an event called One Better World Collective. So if you visit their Facebook page one or their website, onebetterworld.org, Buffy is you know, an incredible woman to celebrate, very important to the Ace of Cups and their members. So I just thought, you know, because I like the details, you know that I was like, ooh, Buffy, Dalai Lama connection. And Rachel, we're going to put that up uh, in the next few days on our Facebook page too. We'll have all the details of the event. Great. And I love you ladies, by the way. I don't want to get all gushy, but I couldn't love people that I'm not, you know, I, I couldn't love you anymore. So it's great to hear you and learn about you every day. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel Ann, for sharing that information and also sharing the love. And I think We've covered so much and we could probably talk for another hour, but we're gonna let people go on with uh, what's next for them. And we, again, are so grateful to have this opportunity to uh, wrap up uh, the Women's History Month for 2021. And back in 2020, we had Ace of Cups with the Creative Longevity and Wisdom Award. And let's just imagine that we will all be together. I can't wait to see you all yeah. live and in person again. <laughs> Uh, so grateful to those who came on and posed their questions and uh, listened to what we had to say, our conversants, again, um, our team with Fielding. So grateful to everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day and life. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, man. Thank you so much. Uh